that I now understand. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. Uh, got it. Okay, so that's uh, <laughs> that's motivated ourselves with this. Uh, what I have shown uh, shared last um, yesterday, but uh, maybe some people haven't seen this um, because you have to leave earlier. So, um, <coughs> sorry. Let's have a look of why um, we are uh, doing this the third day for all the customization today. So this is the end goal, right? Okay, so now um, we are ready. We have our uh, trained model. And this model is trained in 760 million uh, parameters, GPT. Um, so it's not that big, but um, we have trained it distributedly. So the first thing we need to do is that we need to merge the uh, checkpoints back to um, one checkpoint. So that's what we're gonna do first. And that's what this step one is about. So it's a, it's a loading the saved uh, model and then merge it back. So all the layers is being merged. Now, that's good. Now we have done this successfully. The second thing we're going to do is that we're going to take the new merged checkpoint. And then we are going to ask for samples. And we are going to ask for four samples. So now it is generating text and it's finished generating text. Um, remember that we say it is a sample 760 million parameters with iteration 1 million. So that's the one we're going to use here. So let's take this one. This is the longest. So this is the generated text from my GPT model, Swedish one. So as you can see, um, it is doing pretty good. It says Raspberry King Tone Plus seems to be the potent weight loss and weight management supplement that can motivate a lot of people in Kristianstad, Sweden, to adopt a healthier, more active lifestyle and thus get all the benefits this Raspberry King Tone extract provides so abundantly. So. That's it. That's how you do uh, generated um, text from a trained GPT model using Megatron. Okay, so um, that's why <laughs> we are needing to do all kinds of customization today. Um, so um, these um, uh, speakers for today, uh, I, I don't uh, want to kind of take uh, their spot and introduce them, but um, just briefly, saying uh, who they are. Uh, Dennis Timoni, he's the guy, the first uh, actually, who actually uh, deployed a GPT-3 model uh, to Triton, as in to serve it and deploy it. So he's gonna talk about how to deploy with different alternatives. So, you know, when, once you train your GPT model, you really wanted to deploy it and then use it in real um, life. So of course that you needed to have a mechanism of deploying it and he's gonna talk in detail about that. So do take advantage of asking him any questions with regard to deployment. Avnash as well as Ashish, uh, they will both be talking about NVIDIA's vision with regard to training very large language models and how to use them and what kind of, uh, uh, use cases that they see and uh, that we actually accumulated as well um, by having a lot of contact with the industry. So do ask them question if you have any with regard to the visions of big NLP that um, uh, NVIDIA has. All right, so we're gonna recap on what happened uh, in the past two days. And then because it's important, we're gonna not only modify everything almost, and then we are going to, um, and then we are going to try and try and fit Swedish customization into the entire workflow. So yesterday, well, in day one, we have a, a trained multi-node uh, Megatron uh, in two nodes by default, and then we, see that you know indeed once that we can um, 
customize whatever that we, uh, we want. And then we are able to train a multi-node and scale accordingly. And in day two, we first figuring out, uh, after we extracted the toy data, we figure out how to uh, estimate the compute time needed in order to do an end-to-end -end training run so that we know that you know, we can <laughs> request um, resources on Basilius, Superpart, and then we know that approximately if we do our uh, training utilizing GPU well enough, then we should be able to um, uh, have more realistic training time. All right, and then we know that uh, by default that why we wanted to process the uh, loosely uh, done JSON file that was our raw corpus into MMAP format because they will accelerate the data loading of performance because as you scale your model size and you scale your data size and you wanted the data loading to be effective. So we understand how this is working. And then we verify that what was needed to be done in order to, um, in order to have a GPT to BPE tokenizer. And to, in today that we are going to train from scratch our own Swedish GPT 2 BP compatible tokenizer. And then um, the highlight of yesterday is that we understand how to do profiling and, and, and actually iterate uh, iterate in order to improve. And then some of um, the teams has already shared they have up the micro batch size uh, in order to uh, feed uh, into as much as the GPU can. However, Today, the challenge is a little bit uh, different than uh, day two's challenge. So this is what we're going to go through in day three. First is that we're going to uh, get our own data again, and that will be from Sproul Bank. And, and Swedish Sproul Bank has offered a lot of different resources. Some of them are high quality. Some of them are less high quality. And then. Um, in today, after the presentation, we will be summarizing of what we see from NVIDIA's perspective, giving you a suggestion of what we think is a good uh, data blending strategy. So when you are scaling the data, you need to um, find a way to blend the data during the training time, sampling from those different sources of your data. Because you know you, you cannot, <laughs> you probably won't be able to get one singular source of a gigantic data set. So you need to kind of concatenate a lot of different data sources, which means that you need to weigh the importance, so to speak, the, uh, of the data sources after you have processing and cleaned it. And then we are going to clean and filter the data. Uh, we will offer a few suggestions so for example, like language uh, detection and so on, we will talk about this in detail. We will uh, do a toy uh, simplified uh, custom customization of the function to modified NLTK in order to cut the sentences out of document. And this is in no way, uh, how do you say, it is in no way a production ready kind of sentence cutter. And I know that some of you guys have created your own Swedish sentence cutter. So, you know, do take the advantage of today's um, lab to, to see how you can embed that into Megatron preprocessing uh, training, uh, preprocessing script. Then we, as, as I said previously, we're going to train our own um, byte level BP tokenizer on Swedish data, the toy data that we get over here, and to see to it that you know it actually can do tokenization properly. And as we as we understand that from day two, that there are some compliances of condition, the pre-tokenizer, I mean, that needs to be compliant to in order to make sure that the tokenizer you train on the from scratch on the toy Swedish data uh, will be compliant to the GPT BP tokenizer. Then again, we're gonna pre-processing uh, to the MMAP format with, um, with building in, as in we're gonna incorporating the sentence, the custom sentence splitter that we modify NLTK from to uh, integrate that into the pre-processing data pi script of Megatron. Yeah, and then we are going to, uh, uh, this you can do profiling, but I turn off profiling for day three's challenge because Day three's challenge is go big or go home. That means that that's a completely different uh, strategy. If you think about it, um, you have 40 gigabytes of um, per GPU. If you fill it up with data, when you up your uh, micro batch size, then you give it less space for your model to 
to get bigger. So today's challenge is go big. So, you know, that's all the hint I'm gonna give you. Cool? All right. So um, about acquiring your own uh, and cleaning data, um, we're going to go through this. And that's actually the reason why um, I show in day one about web scraping. So I'm um, not going to read this, but basically what's important in this sense is that uh, we all know that in the IoT age, you got a lot of data from the internet. In fact, Sprobank uh, has scraped uh, some a lot of data from web forum, chat rooms. These data are not necessarily having high quality and might have bad languages built in. So making sure that you actually examine your data. And if you have the, um, uh, if you actually have the uh, resources, uh, consulted linguistic uh, people in order to find a way to systematically clean or blacklisted or filter those um, languages that you want, you don't want them to be there. Uh, after you have cleaned that data. It's probably important to actually get um, some basic statistic because um, again, uh, when you uh, specified the, the sequence lens, um, the sequence lens when you sample from your um, document of the sentences, you really, really don't want to have like a really short one or two words and you pad zero for the rest of them because that's going <laughs> to, especially when you use micro size, uh, batch size one, then that make, can make uh, your model's uh, gradient go woohoo like this. So um, not a good idea. So it's probably good to actually check from within your data set what's the average token in the sentences, what, um, what is uh, the average sentence count per document, and how long is the uh, is the document? Do you have like one sentence document and so on? And we're going to have a look at that. So you guys have gone through the web scraping. So this is for the NVIDIA block English, but you can do the same thing with few modifications uh, to actually scrape the, uh, the, the data, the, the websites and the web pages that you have the permission to. So now this is very important. I hope you have read it inside of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, web scraping, um, it, it, it's not a problem from the technical standpoint that you can actually scrape whatever you see fit. However, there are legal concerns attached to it. So do make sure that you consulted um, the legal uh, in your department to see to it that you do have the permission to actually scrape the web pages that you wanted to extract the text from. All right, so now we're finally getting into clean. So to clean, we are going to uh, propose uh, three generic steps that you should add on top of uh, whatever that that is that you acquiring the data from. Uh, the first thing is that if you want to train mono, monolingual um, uh, GPT or whatever language models, the first thing you probably want to do is wanting to have a way to identify uh, what document is this language belong to. So for example, uh, we will go through this in the lab as well, that uh, you wanted to, for example, filter out uh, Danish, Finnish, German, and so on. But if you do want them in, then um, you, you might not want to filter them out. But in any cases, you need to have a way to be able to detect what language does this document belong to. There are other libraries as well. So this is just one example. The second thing we absolutely need to do is to duplicate, especially, especially when you uh, crawl data from the internet. Because I, I don't know if you guys actually noticed this, there's a lot of things that's been like a copy paste over in the internet, um, across the internet in many different sources. So for example, if you have a, a news uh, especially like breaking news, kind of like, you know, a, a tsunami happened somewhere in Thailand and a lot of people died and you will have this kind of <laughs> um, news that replicate itself that across a lot of uh, uh, newspapers. And then you, you don't want to read all of the newspapers, so you wanted to have a way to kind of like uh, duplicate based on a similarity threshold on a document level, right? So again, it's very important to be able to deduplicate because you don't want your model, especially when you sam the sampling strategy of sampling from um, the document and sampling the sentence in the document, then you find out that actually you're just training exactly the same thing, then there's no point, right? You just kind of um, like, like the toy data that I have uh, 
done for day one, just duplicate them all the way through, which is not very good. And you guys, some of you guys have already noticed that, that the loss doesn't really go down that much because it's a, it's a toy synthetic duplicated data, right? So it's very important, again. There are two um, ways that um, you can do uh, that. There are many other ways, in fact. And the one that's been proposed by the Megatron um, repo, in fact, it is in the, uh, let me just show you what it is. In the, uh, in the Megatron repo, it's right here. They even have a readme. It's being proposed right here. So that's the, okay. So that's the one that we're gonna use today, right here. So um, you do, uh, I do want to tell you guys that you have other mechanism of duplication. So this is more traditional method, and this is like a deep neural network type of method. And this one is from Facebook FASI if I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> uh, but in any cases, you have many different ways of you can do the duplications. And then one needs to kind of iterate it through again, just to see uh, if actually it duplicated the, uh, the documents that you actually wanted to remove. So here's an example. Uh, what you do, uh, again, we, we will go through this uh, in the lab. So um, we will be using o OSH that is called local sensitive hashing. So the mechanism of the LSH works like this. You first create shingles. So that's just like sliding windows of engram, just sliding through your documents and create shingles, what they call shingles. And then from that onwards, you create a fingerprint. And that fingerprint, the fingerprint pair, you're given two pair of documents and you create a shingles across these two documents. This pair of documents, you will collect them and create fingerprint, and they will be fingerprint A, fingerprint B. <coughs> then you're gonna do min hash, and then you're going to use Jacquard uh, uh, score, Jacquard similarity comparison score, in order to uh, check whether this is too similar with the threshold. And if that's too similar, then you're just gonna remove it, right? And that's what we're going to go through. We're going to purposefully create duplicated document by the, um, the, MV, um, the MV block that we have created it in order to make sure that um, we, this mechanism, the local sensitive hashing is working. So <coughs> that's the first um, we're gonna do in the, in the lab when we do the cleaning. All right. The third thing when it comes to cleaning is that it's very important, as I said, to find sentence boundary. There are many uh, different libraries that you can use to, um, to, to do sentence splitting. So NLTK has, a, has one, it's called sentence tokenizer, but that is not necessarily the one that's the best for uh, Swedish. I guess some of you guys might have found out. And then you have sentence splitter two that does it. And then you can even create your own sentence cutter, which is what we're going to do uh, in our uh, lab. Then we're going to have a quotation sentence cutter. But again, this is just a toy so that you could use it um, and modified uh, on your own of whatever sentence cutter that you see fit, integrating other libraries as well. So for this particular one, it actually uses re, but inside of the lab, we're going to inherit from NLTK and do quotation um, cutting. All right, so again, let's have a look at this uh, demo that I have uh, created to, um, to summarize these three things about uh, cleaning, that it's no way uh, the, the only steps, it should be the starting steps, three steps that you should add on to. So for example, like I said, you should probably blacklist some words. You should probably uh, check the quality of uh, the, the sentences and the document inside of the raw corpuses and stuff like that. So this is in no way the only three steps, but they are at least a start. So let's have a look. In this demo, we are going to go through a three steps approach in order to clean our data sets. Now, it might have other steps that you would like to embrace in order to clean your data sets. At least this is a start. So for the sake of checking the sanity, of those three steps that we're going to use, we're going to use a hand-crafted data set. 
to test those three steps. I have previously downloaded uh, from EuroParl those row corpuses uh, in these languages. Now, for the sake of demoing, I'm going to only use subsets so it goes faster uh, of those languages, the documents in those languages. I'm going to create handcrafted duplicates and then I'm going to merge them together, shuffle them. Now I got 1,824 documents. So first, we need to have a way to detect what language does this document belong to in order to decide whether we want to remove it or not. Now, our target language is Swedish, so we need to, of course, have a way to identify other language as well as the target language in order to decide whether we're going to remove it. So this is Danish, this is Swedish, this is Finnish, this is Danish. Cool. So now we have a way to identify the, um, the language that the document belongs to. We're going to filter out all other languages except for Swedish. The second thing we're going to do is to deduplicate. Now, we're going to use a library which is recommended by Megatron LM. It says local sensitive hash. This algorithm works as following. It will take shingles, which is basically sliding window, of uh, ngram or five, uh, you can change those, of course, um, sliding window of uh, ngrams throughout your document. And then go it's going to create fingerprint. And then it's going to use your card similarity to uh, compare a pair of given documents, whether they're similar or not. And then in this case, we're going to um, create toy data sets in order to in order to check whether this algorithm is working or not so we have the ground truth label in this column so we're going to print out both the ground truth as well as the um, the similarity threshold that uh, this algorithm have um, have worked out and here we're using 0 0.85 so as you can see it now it says that I randomly selected from that toy data set. It says that, okay, now this pair of documents is identical. And the algorithm also says true. Yes, it's identical and the score is one. Now, you don't always get score one. <laughs> That's because we um, make it exactly identical. So that you might want to play around with this threshold in order to decide what works for you. So let's see, now we have a false one as well. So we are, we are confident that this algorithm will work. Step three, we're going to find sentence boundary. Now, NLTK is a very popular library. It also comes with the sentence tokenizer. However, it doesn't always work for all languages. For example, for this particular sample text, uh, it doesn't even split the um, commas and so on. Now, for the sake of um, having flexibility, so we're going to create our own sentence cutter on top of NLTK. Now, as you can see, it might not be what you would like it to be, but I mean, at least this is a start. This is a way to show you that you have a way to create your own sentence cutter using simple things such as the uh, Python built-in library three. Now we're gonna put it all together and then we're going to wrap it into our my cleaning script pie. So we're going to filter out all the undesirable languages. So it should be Swedish left from this step. And then we're going to keep track and remove all the duplicates. This time we're going to higher up the threshold to 0 0.99. And because, you know, we know that we make it identical. So um, it's going to be one. So, you know, we're going to cut off all this 20 document, if you remember from the top, that we create 20 exact, exactly duplicate of the Swedish documents. So what's left is that we're going to throw away very short sentence. In fact, we're going to throw away single sentence document, as in 
the documents only contain one singular sentence. All right, so let's kick it start. So we start with 1824, which is our Han crafted documents. We remove all other languages, Finnish, German, Danish, Norwegian, and then we are left with 120 Swedish documents. Now we remove the 20 duplicates that we have handcrafted, created it. And then finally, on step three, we're going to remove singular documents. So these are the two single sentence document that we remove. And now we're left with 98 clean documents. Okay, so um, with regard to uh, the data weighing strategy, uh, like, like I said, um, this, for every language, you should uh, compose your own data weighing uh, matrices or uh, this type of things. And it's not, this is uh, the English one, and this is trained uh, together with collaboration. Um, so that is trained with Megatron as a back end, and this one, oi, why is it uh, suddenly moved by itself? So uh, as I said, usually you will have a lot of data sources and you, you need to manually examine and establish the criteria of what is high quality. And, and then these are like basic statistics, uh, at least you, you need to actually get in order to be able to uh, construct your weighing percentage strategy as well as the, I don't know why I keep doing that. So, so um, it's very important, especially when you train as you scale the GPT-3 model size, and then when you acquire more and more data set from many different uh, type of data sources, it's very, very important to, like, to actually construct this and iterate through this in order to see if your model converge. So uh, the last things that is that we're gonna summarize everything we said. So basically, the, the best ideal situation is that you acquire gigantic data set first. So in open AI paper, basically what they say is that they have 45 terabytes of data and they clean it after they have aggressively cleaning it, they are left with this. So that gave you an idea of like how, how, how aggressive you should be cleaning. In fact, um, in my uh, first attempt, when I trained the first Swedish GPT-3 uh, models, uh, it was uh, 2.7 billion. And then I didn't do this aggressive cleaning. In fact, I didn't do cleaning at all. And then my model is uh, performed uh, not that well with regard to, not, not because that the model is not converging, it did converge. It's just that it doesn't speak the language that I wanted to, I think it curses. So I, I had to <laughs> whip it into shape. And then of this, um, out of this uh, around 200 gigabytes of the data that I have collected and scraped and then do whatever I can to, um, acquire those data set, I had to do heavy cleaning, like seriously heavy cleaning, and I'm left with about 50 gigabyte. A question? Yes, yes. If you have a lot of headlines or tables and so on, how do you hmm. clean those? Uh, headlines and tables. Headings yeah. in the text, do you keep them or remove them or? <laughs> um, well, it depends. Um, if you, if you have the table and then the table, uh, for example, in finance Megatron, as I understand that, that table has a structure and then they wanted to uh, generate it, uh, this type of, uh, um, uh, how do you say, um, uh, informations that uh, has this structure, then you need to keep that. But for me, I don't actually care about tables. So I kind of just anything when I have HTML tag, when I find out that's a table, I just remove them. But, but that's me, right? Because mm, yeah. <laughs> different purposes has, yes. With regard to heading, again, um, I check if it's like really short. Usually heading is really short. So I check um, my uh, uh, sequence length is 512. And if it's even less than, I think if I have to pad more than, uh, more than half because it's too short, then I cut it as well. So basically, um, it's really opinionated, as in, if you um, want to, uh, your sequence length is uh, 1024, if that was yours, and or 2048, then if the shorter your sentences or document is, then, then the, the, the harder, I mean, your model has to train because, you know, you'll pad a lot of, you, you will just pad it 
and it, it, it's it's not um, good if you have like say 90% of your document are really really uh, the, the sentence inside of a document are really really short so that's not good right so yeah so that's the reason uh, why aggressive cleaning is very very important okay so um going back to this and then we're gonna get head to the lab <laughs> sorry so we first remove undesirable languages uh, uh, why why did i do that because you know um it, it, in a, such a small um a nordic language i could easily just you know grab whatever I want, but you know, it's for debugging because it's easier to debug. Actually, you will find out for monolingual training, it's easier to debug if you actually stay with monolingual corpuses. The second thing is that um, it's very, very important uh, to not include downstream task data set into your training data set. It's uh, so that you're not kind of cheating, right? So for example, if you have a classification um, data and or uh, the data that's uh, summarizing sentences or any any of those sorts. Don't, don't include those data set into your training data set. Um, as we have walked through, you have many different ways to do deduplications. We introduce one in the lab, uh, but I do encourage you to check out Facebook FASI. Why? Because they, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> they allow you to um, build that library using uh, GPU. So I'm kind of attracted to that. <laughs> and, and, and it's more important with regard to duplication, you need to do it on the document level, not on the sentence level. Um, if you have, if uh, there's already known high quality references corpus, always make sure that you weigh it more in, in, in that table of like uh, 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 data sources and the, and the tokens uh, and how many tokens and, the, and the, the percentage of weighing, make sure you weigh it more because the, the high quality data will help your model to, to speak properly. Okay, so um, this last one is uh, the, the question that we have said, this is um, a need to be established as a criteria because uh, depending on how you configure your training, so the longer your uh, sequence length is, you really wanted to, uh, might wanted to take away some of the sentences or the documents that um, that's very, very short. Okay, so we are going to move on to the lab. So in today's lab, uh, the, right here, so lab two, one, uh, right here, I'm gonna take away this. So if you, I mean, this is a sprawl banks data. So basically everything I do here is borrowing theirs. You can simply just kernel, restart and run all. Then you will, you will, you will, you will get the data in the right place. But uh, please do remember if you haven't done that already, otherwise you're gonna get the errors of like say this uh, folder or this uh, directory does not exist. Go to the start here, make sure you run through this. So they will create all the corresponding folders that you need to hold your data, okay? Then you can run through this, just start, uh, restart and run all. And another thing that I wanted to remind you guys that I forgot to kind of highlight this is this, that uh, AI Megatron uh, English Python. So in here, especially when it comes to, I don't know if you guys have noticed, every time when you run through this profiling, uh, yesterday, every time you you do a different configuration, almost always you are going to create new of these files, and you're going to get more and more and more and more. Again, uh, as I said in in the beginning of um, uh, of this uh, bootcamp, that we have limited resources as a team um, in disk space, so make sure to clean up after yourself. So what I mean is this: you go to uh, You go to the English folder and you see there's a lot of MPY. So you just remove, force remove anything to do with that MPY. Please do that. And or anything to do with uh, uh, when you do the Swedish training run, you will start to see all these things popping up. And, you know, we as a team needs to <laughs> due diligence. Otherwise, you know, we will run out of disk space and that's not happy for anyone. So please do do that. And if you haven't done that for yesterday's English folder, please go ahead and do that. So now we're gonna, yeah, yeah. So now we're going to head it over to the lab and um, 
we have it until 10, 20. Good. To, to finish lap two, one, and lap two, two. Cool. So I'll see you back here at 10, 20. Yes. So please. Uh, yeah, so this is today's agenda. So um, basically, we, we will be running through, again, uh, just to make sure that uh, we're on the same page. Uh, we've done uh, uh, more or less <coughs> this part <coughs> and this part. We're going to do this part and this part. So um, I think maybe it's easier, in that sense, to go through um, all of them and then let you guys work. Um, things that um, some of you guys are probably still stay here. Uh, please uh, take note that it, um, you do not need to finish this one in order to go further. So um, now we are on the train your GPT tokenizer and data preprocessing with the uh, Swedish Rotex. So just to recap from yesterday, uh, we have discovered that basically in order for the um, tokenizers, the, the Hugging Face tokenizers trainer to train taking in a raw text file to train a GPT-2, uh, GPT, sorry, GPT-BP compatible <clears throat> tokenizer, <coughs> we need to ensure that the pre-tokenizer and the decoder is there. So this is the, I probably need to make it bigger. And with regard to Megatron, there is a special token, end of text, which is used in append EOD, end of document. So the difference when you do pre-processing data for GPT, you need to supply vocabulary and merge file, which we train, obtained from the previous step. And then we specify the tokenizer type to be BP to BP tokenizer. And then we have to append EOD. For BERT, uh, you can modify however you want. It's something else. So this is not uh, in the, in, included in today's course, but if you're interested, I can show you in a separate workshop possibly how to do this. So if we go to the lab, so um, to start here, Pi, always uh, help you to navigate. So now we're in lab three, uh, lab two, uh, three, the notebook. As always, we need to install the tokenized library. So just to make sure that we got the data we needed, we need to uh, run this first. And then, after you have run it, you should see something similar like this. Wait, okay, I got kicked out now, but okay. Then you just verify that you have this file. And for to to train, uh, oh, okay, to train a, uh, um, a this is to train a different vocabulary size. So in general. When you obtain your raw text, you train a different uh, variety of vocabulary size, just you know, to back up. So this is the 30 to 1, and this is the one we're going to use. Then after you've done this, in fact, you can again just kernel, restart, and run all, then you are done with this. Here in the fourth notebook, uh, now that it doesn't let me anymore. Okay, but in any ways, in the fourth notebook, let's directly go to here, the fourth notebook. In the fourth notebook, you will write a solution, uh, you will write a my process data pie incorporating this quotation mark sentence cutter 
into the preprocessing pie. So you need to modify this to create your own preprocessing data pie and run through this successfully. Again, this is not required in order for you to go to lab five because in this notebook, the first thing you do is that you will be running through this first in order to obtain the file that you needed for lab, uh, for, for the, the fifth notebook. Okay, so this is just an exercise to, to know how to hack Megatron preprocessing pipe, basically. And afterwards, we will be going to the go big or go home, right here. And this time we will turn off, right here this time, as you can see, we will turn off and sight. Because that will, have that tiny amount of overhead that um, might impact on how big your model can be. Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently today, um, you know, because of the, sec the, 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 the fact that we need to um, give you more time to work on the labs. And then I don't wanna keep interrupting and moving you guys in between the breakout room and the main. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna introduce this. So that's, these are the arguments that there's a lot of arguments in Megatron, but these are kind of the, the important arguments. Those were the model architecture um, arguments. This is of your choice, of course. These are what we have um, talked about uh, in day one and day two, basically. Um, and also thanks to Xian Chao, he has uh, elaborated this in, <laughs> in great detail. So these two are the one that allow you to, as we said it in day two, to actually scale your model size to theoretically one trillion parameters. The one that, that we have not really touched on is the virtual pipeline stage. But in fact, I have already said it um, uh, about the pipelining. That's basically the concept of the interleaving virtual pipeline stage. But um, the implementation is a little bit more complicated than that. But the concept is there. We've talked about this. So basically the micro batch size and the global batch size and the fact that turning on FP16, the floating uh, point 16 instead of floating point 32 will help you to reduce the memory print in your uh, GPU. So, so if you use precision to be floating point 32, then you will take up more space in your GPU memory if you use 14.16, yes, you might lose um, you know, precision. However, it will um, allow you to either up your batch size or up your model size. Uh, another plus is that it will even give you um, the capability of accessing the CUDA kernels tensor cores. So it will get accelerated further. One last thing I probably didn't touch on, and I think it's important to touch on, is that when you do the training, either you use train eaters or you use train samples. You don't use them, uh, they are mutually exclusive and you cannot use both of them. You can use only one of them during one training run. The train iterations basically will go through the sampling of the document that you have uh, converted into the MMAP format, that is your bin and IDX files. And it will sample from that. And it will, it will go through as many iterations as you said in is specified in your train iteration. But this has nothing, um, ha has very, um, it's not the exact same thing as epoch. It is just to sample through according to how you specify your micro uh, and macro batch size. Chan sample, ch the train samples, on the other hand, is saying that this is what I was using uh, basically. So is that if you have tiny data set and you want to test the things out and you say, I, I don't actually care. <clears throat> I just want, <clears throat> I just want to have, let's say 300 billion tokens. 
you can provide it only one singular tiny sample, like what we're doing in day one. And you just keep sample from the exact same data point. That's what train samples is doing. So these two are mutually exclusive. <clears throat> you can either use one or the other, not both at the same time. Okay. <coughs> With that said, we are going to work until we are finishing with uh, lab two, four, here. And I will see you guys at 12 o'clock. Uh, let's see, 14 out of 22. Okay, so let's end the poll then, shall we? Wolfgang? Yes, then we share results. Okay. Um, let me show you guys uh, the new schedule, so to speak. So I guess you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So um, we're going to do a bit uh, differently because it looked like uh, some people already finished lab five. Uh, so basically, um, after right from this point onwards to, in fact, not, uh, I should actually do this one. I don't know why it didn't change. Oh, I should change that to 1.30. We're gonna, to 1.30. We are going to, um, we're going to still continue the challenge, which I will give you a tip. And then from this point onwards, we are going to, we're going to have Dennis, who is already here with us. Um, talking about the different alternative of deploying such a big natural language processing model. And then we will have 15 minutes break in between this talk and that talk. So if you have any questions, take advantage of asking him and or continue on your lab. Yes. And then afterwards, we will have um, the <laughs> two data scientists, also researchers from NVIDIA. They are in US time. So basically they wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> to just join this uh, bootcamp and then do the presentation and answering to your questions. So, you know, uh, do remember to give them, you know, applause, you know, thanking them for waking up in, in the middle <laughs> of the night to join this bootcamp. So I hope that is okay with everyone. Um, afterwards, before three o'clock, we will have a short discussions and final remarks. And they will also give you time in this 15 minutes to finish the survey. Uh, we have a survey link here in the master document of the survey. Uh, do leave uh, your comments, uh, your experiences and so on so that I can improve. Uh, I mean, we as NVIDIA uh, uh, Book and Hackathon can improve ourselves because we, we plan to do the same uh, bootcamp next year with the modification taking in the feedback, of course. And um, if you guys have uh, any uh, questions and then um, and or that continuous, uh, continuously need support in different topic with regard to either the bootcamp and or NLP and or uh, NVIDIA products and services to contact us either through um, the Nordic sales team, uh, which you guys have probably heard of. I can also uh, put the, their emails there. Um, with regard to like pricing and stuff, because you know I, I don't know anything about that. Uh, if you wanted to know anything else, such as your know, te technicality with regard to NVIDIA SDK, such as Megatron and or Nemo and or our conversational AI stack, uh, you can contact me and or the other TAs, um, NVIDIA TAs here in this bootcamp. All right, with that said, we have, there are still 10 seconds. There's still 10 seconds left. Uh, so everyone should be uh, jumping back in 10 seconds. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to take away the, so people, you see people jumping back. Good. All right. Welcome back everyone. So um, now we have Dennis here with us and um, Dennis, he's the first and actually the only <laughs> person that has deployed uh, uh, successfully uh, Megatron uh, billion parameters um, 
to uh, actually deploy this successfully and make inference. And then he's now going to help us and talk uh, to us about how to deploy this in different alternatives. Um, would you please might uh, kind of introduce yourself first before going through this slide? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Zenodia. So yeah, my name is Denis Timonian. I'm Deep Learning Solutions Architect at NVIDIA. And today we're briefly discuss some uh, inference approach for uh, inference approach for for the huge transformer based models. We discuss what why the inference is so important, uh, what approaches exist, and what the problems exist in general are, are with the at, with the huge models at inference time. Uh, so let's start. Oh, one second. I will. Yeah. Okay. So. There are three main stages exist uh, for any neural network model. To, we have to move through to uh, run this model into production. Uh, and for huge language models, they are the same. So we have some business idea at the beginning. We have an idea that we, where we can use the huge model. We're talking about the huge models now, where we can use the huge language model to solve some problem in the world or in our company, in our department. And this brings us money or some happiness and so on. So, and we have this idea, we understand that we need to train the model. And I hope that you did the step in the, on the previous stages of this bootcamp. And uh, after we have, we trained the big and or huge language model, we have to run the inference. And inference is really important thing because in the last years, uh, about 10 times or hundreds times more uh, resources required for inference in comparison with the training. And that means that we want to, our inference will be, will be the faster, uh, the, with the lower latency, higher throughput. And this allows us to run the test faster, run the tests faster, run the experiments, uh, different research procedures and get the results from our models much faster and integrate this uh, solution, this huge uh, language model into production with more e easier. And what is important about the inference of huge models, we have goals. We want to infer huge models in an efficient and convenient way. Yeah, and this includes with the things like we want to maximize the utilization of GPUs. Uh, we know that uh, huge models, uh, usually they're quite big to be run on one GPU. It's not possible in general, that's why they are huge. On the right side, we see the picture of the elephant that it sits in the try tries to sit in the box and box this is the GPU A100 with 80 gigs, and elephant is this is the model our GPT3 that has about 350 gigabytes of weight, and uh, that means that we have to split our model and have a good communication between uh, split our model on multiple GPUs and have to good communication between these GPUs to utilize this. Uh, overall pipeline, inference pipeline to utilize GPUs in uh, the best way we can. And we have, we want to have a unified and simple inference solution for many models in our production. Usually we have not only one model in the production. We have CV, ASR, NLP, and so on, many different models. And that would be nice for engineers to have like unified uh, stack of tools and frameworks that can be used for all of these approaches, for all of these models. That helps us to maintain the models, yeah, maintain the production in a good, in a good way, in a good condition. Uh, we want to have easier deployment and scaling and support tool, yeah, and we want to maximize throughput and minimize latency. What are challenges? Uh, huge model re models requires more memory than available on per one GPU, and yeah, we discussed this. Uh, about a couple of months be be ago, we even didn't have any good tool to infer uh, to run the inference of huge models, and and now we have some, and I will present them. Uh, uh, 
we want it's important thing we want to model need model need to be optimized or compiled inference uh, is quite different a little bit different thing in comparison with training at training time we have a lot of we, we can have a quite complex graph in, into in our neural network and training has a lot of different redundant parts and a lot of uh, additional memory is needed for GPU. That's why when we switch from training to inference, these redundant parts of the neural in the neural networks uh, need to be removed to save the memory to uh, allow to run in with the lower latency. And that's why this the model it, that would be would be good to optimize and compile the model before the running the inference and frameworks that exist now for training huge models they're quite complex this is quite heavy and big pytorch for example if we're talking about the megatron pytorch based uh, frameworks and if you want to use it in the inference time again you have to use this framework on many servers you have to maintain different code versions and so on it is not so convenient okay this main goals and changes and let's talk about the megatron now uh, I, I hope that you know uh, now that Megatron allows this framework that allows us to train the huge models in parallel on multiple GPUs and DGXs. And it supports two main model of models of parallelism. It, this, the first one is pipeline parallelism, when we split the model in depths uh, on, for example, on two parts, the tail and the head, and we can place it on two DGXs tail will be on one DGX and head on the, uh, the other DGX and we can run uh, in the pipeline request like just the text data will we can put it into the tail of the model and after that after the tail will be computed on one DGX we can put the outputs on the another DGX to compute the head and get the outputs and the another uh, method of parallelism is tensor parallelism and this this is when we can split each layer of the model in into different pieces and compute these pieces in parallel for each layer. That means that we can split our model in in parallel on eight GPUs, for example, or on two GPUs like we have on the slide. That means that we can compute the inference faster. We compute the faster and get the uh, result faster and the pipeline parallelism allows us to maximize GPU utilization and in maximize the throughput because we can use the bigger batch size and tensor parallelism uh, minimizes the latency because we can compute model faster but at the same time uh, batch size may be uh, less yeah and these two techniques can be combined in inference time too and that's it, and I think that you did it in training time. You understand how how you understood how it works, how tensor and pipeline parallelism works. Let's talk about the inference approach by NVIDIA that exists now. There are two main approaches to run approaches exist to run the huge inference models, huge models in inference, and um, one of them is faster transformer. This is the library from the NVIDIA uh, that specially was created for the inference of the transformer-based models. And the second one is another one. It's better to say another one. It's TensorRT library by NVIDIA. This is the special compilation and optimization library created by NVIDIA for the inference of wide range of neural network models. Let's talk about them, about each of them are in, and let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each of this approach. Faster transformer, this is the library of specially created for transformer based models. Advantages are uh, they, this library supports transformers and huge transformers out of the box. This is important for us now. And it supports both tensor and pipeline parallelism techniques, like we discussed it yeah, in previous slides. And uh, this library provides the fastest inference for GPT-3-like models for autoregressive 
GPT-3-like models. When we compute some, when I compute some attention on some layers for some to predict some token, some next work or next piece of the sentence. And after that, we repeat the procedure to compute the next, uh, another one token. And that in faster transformer has the implementation of efficient implementation of the attention recomputation mechanism of, and it uh, avoids the recomputation of the some attention parts that was already that were already computed on the previous stages. It's important and you can dive into this when you you can look look at the code, for example, or contact me and so on. And this library has Python binnings and it can be integrated with the Triton inference server for fast deploy. We will discuss what is Triton inference server on the next slides. Uh, cons that this library has is it supports only strict types of models and layers, like only BERT GPT-2 and Megatron GPT-3. And all other models like, for example, visual transformers that are quite popular now, the models that has uh, like models that have combination, for example, of transformer layers and convolutional layers, yeah, the mixture of these layers, these models won't be supported. Uh, out of the box, and it's quite complex to add some additional layer, some support of some custom model into this library, because Foster Transformer has uh, reconstructs the model inside it. When you run this uh, the binary file Foster Transformer, you put the as an argument in in the input of this binary file uh, the name of the model that you want to reconstruct, for example, GPT-3. And Faster Transformer creates the model from scratch by itself. It's in, it doesn't know about all other like complex structure, complex models and custom models. TensorT. TensorT, this is another one library, this very famous library by NVIDIA. And it compiles and optimizes the uh, neural networks and prepares them for inference. And what is good, this library supports a lot of models and a lot of types of layers, yeah? Uh, about hundreds of them. So you can have the quite custom model with transformer layers inside, some convolutional, different normalization techniques. You can have like some custom model and it can be uh, exported into the Onyx. And after that, TensorT, take this model and can optimize it layer by layer. And this is really good. You can do a lot of experiments or research and run them into the inference. It provides the fastest inference BERT-like for BERT-like models. Faster Transformers uh, provides the fastest, fastest inference for GPT-3-like models. And TensorT is the best one for BERT-like models, for non-autoregressive models, for models that where you can put the input like a text, like sentence of the text. And at the output time, you just have the vector, like embedding vector for this sentence, something like this in general, uh, in, in, for the general variant of BERT. It has Python bindings even better than Faster Transformer, and it can be integrated with Triton Inference Server for fast deploy. Again, disadvantages, there are no parallelism techniques out of the box, pipeline parallelism techniques can be supported with Triton. Uh, I will show you how to do this. And additional steps are needed to run huge transformer model uh, for TensorT because Tensor, with TensorT, because TensorT not support, doesn't support the uh, huge models out of the box. And it, this library works quite slow with the GPT-like models. Okay, let's dive a little bit into this approach. NVIDIA Faster Transformer uh, will be first. Okay, uh, what is Faster Transformer? I will hi I highly recommend you to look at the video from GTC 2020 from my colleague Boyan Soyer, who created the um, one of the main developers of Faster Transformer, and he describes in, in depth uh, what is faster than transformer, how it works, and what are speed up for different models. And yeah, this this model has the layers that are written manually uh, on based on CUDA and Kublas, different 
libraries, and it supports FP16 if, uh, convertation, the model into FP16 and int8, where it can be converted into these formats. And it has C++, TensorFlow, and PyTorch APIs now. Uh, you can have a look at this approach in, in depth in using this link. Uh, what's happened, as I said, you can, on the next slide, I will provide pipeline how to use it. Yeah, that would be better. You, to use it, you have to download and build this model, Faster Transformer. And, uh, and on the second stage, you have to export your PyTorch weights of the pre-trained Megatron GPT model that you trained. Yeah, I, I hope that you trained on this at this bot temp. And when you exported the weights, only the weights is this is important thing. You have to run the script to split the weights on the partitions for multiple GPU for Tensor and Pipeline parallelism. This is the example of the script. What the script is doing, it's takes the, as an input, the weights of your model and it splits it onto multiple GPUs. At this, using argument TG, by using this argument, I like notified the script that I want these weights can be split onto eight pieces to run it in tensor parallel later on eight GPUs to minimize the latency. Because for example, I have DGX with eight GPUs on my side. After that, I have to run the script that start the inference of on multiple GPUs and start the inference of GPT model. And this is this example of the script. What is important? There are no flexibility, as I said. This will be really fast inference about from 1.5 to 4 x uh, faster than uh, PyTorch version of the model. But uh, there are no flexibility. Uh, Faster Transformer recreates the model inside internally, and you cannot change it. And it only expects the right weights. If weights will be some uh, with some wrong structure, with some additional layer normalizations that you added to improve the quality, maybe you did the research and understood that this is important. Uh, Faster Transformer won't support this, um, or and it's probably they. It, this library can crash and do not work, or it can run and skip some weights and there are some bad, bad quality maybe in the output. And demo can be run this um, uh, using this link. And you can read more in details about Faster Transformer and GPT-3 demo. How it works, it, this is just short um, slide with the profiling. GPU prop from the profiling GPU profiling tool by NVIDIA inside systems. And it shows how we utilize our GPU. On, at the bottom, we have the utilization of, of our GPU uh, in our framework in TensorFlow at this time. And there are a lot of empty spaces. That means that our GPU just waits for data to compute something. And that means that utilization of GPU is quite low and about only 10 or 20% of time, our GPU computes something, all other 80% there, the GPU just waits for the data and this is very bit, really bad case. And Faster Transformer recreates uh, the kernels of the GPT model and creates the more like, the, it combines the layer, multiple layers of this model, uh, GPT model into one, like fuses. This is the name of this technique is fusion, layer fusing, and use the different other different techniques. And this allows us to utilize GPU much higher. That means that speed at the same time, inference speed will be much higher. For more details, you can watch this video. And the second approach, TensorRT. TensorRT doesn't support huge models out of the box. That's why we need some tool to export the model, our huge model, and to put it in the TensorRT later. This will be Onyx format. And we need the inference solution that helps us to, will help us to uh, use the pipeline parallelism technique. And this will be Triton. So uh, this is the technique that I used in my talk. You can dive into details of this approach more deeper uh, at this using this link. And Dennis, yep. Dennis you don't okay. have to rush because we have time. Don't oh. worry. 
Oh, we do okay. have time. I thought that we have only about 10 minutes. Uh, I no, have a couple no. more slides. Okay, thanks, Nadia. <laughs> uh, yeah, so as I said... Um, and uh, uh, do you mind if I ask a question, actually more generic question about, so we trained our model so far in the bootcamp and we used, let's say like a, according to the hardware configuration, like uh, we split it, our model, like a, we, we use tensor parallelism, uh, model parallelism, uh, like pipelining and so on. And what what we recommend usually at the inference time, like do we do we need to stick to the same way of dividing the model, or do we have like um, um, uh, recommendation on how to divide this model? Like, are we more using pipelining or uh, tensor slicing, or mm -hmm. do? Thanks, Miriam. Yeah, I understand your question. It's okay. <laughs> so, uh, in general, we used, let me scroll back a little bit. Yeah, I, I think it's here. We use these techniques to split our model between multiple DGXs and multiple DGUs in training time because we have a lot of memory required in the training time again. Because when we do, we do two steps, main steps when we do the training. We do forward and backward. This is really important. And at the inference time, we do only forward. And this backward step that we do at the inference, uh, in the training, requires a lot, uh, a lot um, yeah, additional, of additional memory because we have to save activations, different parameters for our optimizer, that there may be different optimizers like LAMP, LARC, and so on, Novograd. Mm -hmm. And we need to save uh, gradients. And that means that in the inference time, we do not need to save all of these like temporary internal stages. We just have to compute the outputs at each layer. And that means that we use, we need a much less, less amount of memory to run this. And usually, for example, we have an example how to run GPT-3 like model with about 100 billion parameters on one DGX, uh, using only one DGX in inference using faster transforming. So this is good measure and this is quite good approach, the best approach I, that I, I think for such type of model. So if your model is uh, can be put on one DGX using tensor parallelism technique, you have to use this and you have to use faster transformer and that would be the best solution. Again, if your model is not so custom, it's like, if, if it's standard, like GPT-like model. Okay. Yeah, thank uh, you very I, much. Did I answer? Yes, your... yes, 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 thank okay. you very much. I think it was important to, to understand that we are not stick to exactly the same model distribution than we had during the training. <laughs> yeah, thank you, nice. thanks a nice lot. Comment. Yeah, I agree, this is important mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so yeah, okay, let's scroll back. So, okay, one more time we have TensorRT, it optimized the model. Uh, I will, if we have some time, an another one, five minutes. So we do, RT, no, yeah. we do, we do. We do have 15 more minutes, don't worry. Okay, uh, TensorRT applies about seven different techniques of optimization to your model, like layer fusion, like, uh, conversion your weights into different precision mode like FP32, FP60 and so on. It tunes this your model and finds the optimal kernels for each of your layers. And what it means, it means like each of your layers on the hardware on GPU on the lowest level can be computed in hundreds of different ways because we have like quite complex structure of GPU and there are a lot of algorithms, a lot of techniques of how to put your data into different pieces of the GPU and how to compute this matrix multiplication, what order, what sizes of submatrices and so on. There are a lot of kernels and TensorRT, one of the technique, it's uh, in real time using your GPU and your inputs, your neural network, uh, tries to find the best kernel, best low level algorithm to run your approach in the fastest way. This is really cool. 
and there are a lot of techniques, other techniques in TensorT, as I said, but it doesn't, this uh, library doesn't support huge models, doesn't support tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism. And we use Onyx to export our model from the Megatron, and we use Triton to support pipeline parallelism. Oh, you can watch my GTC talk where I presented this approach in details. And overall, these are main these are main steps. At the beginning, we have huge Megatron LM model. I used the 40 gigabyte version of the model. 40 gigabyte, this is weights in FP16. And we at the first stage, we trained our model on multiple GPUs and multiple DGXs, like, yeah, like you did. Uh, and that means that we have different pieces of our weights pieces of our weights that can be combined in, that needs to be combined into one model. And uh, to, uh, after, uh, to later, we can use it for optimization and to run the inference. And the Megatron has the special script inside it, Megatron library. Uh, I don't remember the name, but you can find it in my video. So you can run the script and all of the weights, all of the pieces uh, of different weight parts can be combined into one big model. And you, after that, you have to export your model into Onyx. There are uh, some, exist some problems. You cannot do this natively. You have to exclude different uh, manually written kernels that our Megatron team uh, wrote for uh, the Megatron to speed up the training procedure. But after you do this, this can be done using Flex uh, for this script, and you can export this model into Onyx. This will be a huge file uh, with uh, the model inside. And what is what is important, you will have weights and model structure in this file. On, for faster transformer, you had to provide only weights and structure of the neural network is included into the faster transformer library yeah and faster transformer recreates this neural network by himself by itself without your support at, at this time you, we have onyx format file and it support it, it has the graph of your neural network and weights at the same time and that means we have that we have graph with maybe some custom layers uh, maybe some innovative uh, innovative layers that you added after your research. And that means that we can convert this uh, Onyx file into optimized version using TensorT because TensorT supports the different, a, a lot of different layers. This is good for us, for our, uh, for our custom approach. And you can, but what's important, this model again is too big for one GPU. And TensorRT works only on one GPU now. What we have to do, we have to use some tool to split this model into pieces at, for this neural network. My 40 gigabyte net neural network is too big for A140 gigs that I used in this uh, test. So- Dennis, yeah. 40 gigabyte of that model is how, how many parameters? Mm, I, Isn't it? It should be about 80, 18 billion parameters, 18 billion parameters. Yeah, it was something like this, but we awesome. have to, yeah, use an input, uh, even with batch size of one, it does, it's not enough for A100 with 40 gigs. And we have to split our model on two pieces in this approach. Uh, and Onyx is a quite good format and there are exist some tools uh, that to to change the model of your graph, to change your neural network after you, after you trained it. And NVIDIA released the new tool named Onyx Graph Surgeon. This is tool that has Python bindings and you can export your model and like, change the graph of the model like you want it. And, and you can split the model on two or three or five pieces, eight pieces at the same time. And I use this tool to split the model in depth on two pieces, the tail and the head. And that means that I have two more pieces in with 20 gigs each. Uh, and this is good for us. That means that each piece can be optimized by TensorT now on A100 GPU. 
and each of these two, I I run the tensor T and put as an input each each of these pieces yeah of my model, and this part was up optimized were optimized, and after that I have two parts. They're quite good. They're the all uh, like redundant things were remote removed from them and compilation different compilation and optimization techniques were applied by TensorT and I just have to run it in pipeline per release. Uh, what is and I need the Triton inference server to do this. What is Triton inference server? This is library created at NVIDIA and this is inference server. You have to look at it as, as a simple as a simple inference server. This is the like server disk, the binary file, for example, that you can run. You can uh, place some weights of your models, your models into some folders. And after and when you after you run this uh, server, the Triton looks at this folder and automatically um, includes this model into the inference on GPU. You have to provide only config file for this. Like here is the folder, here is the name of the my model, and that's it. Just run it on GPU number one, for example. And all other things will be done by the Triton inference server. So it can take your model and put it into the production, and it will the it will open the Triton opens the some ports on your server, and you can use GPR, you can use HTTP requests. And I don't remember the name, sorry, I don't remember the name of the another one protocol that can be used there with the Triton. It's GRPC. GRPC, thanks. <laughs> yeah, GRPC. And using these two protocols, you can uh, like put the inputs on your server and send the requests on your server with GPU, where our Triton is with our model and get the responses back and that's it and it's quite simple and this is the link with the information about the triton inference server you can use it in the container and the next one thing that is really important for us is triton supports pipeline parallelism mode you can connect multiple models into pipeline in triton you can for example if you have pipeline for uh, detection after that for classification and this is one pipeline you detected some pieces of on your image on your video after that you need to classify all the, all of the detected objects you have to run classification uh, model after this and triton allows you to do this again you just need to write another one config to say like this model output outputs of this model just put them as an input to the another one model. And using this ensemble techniques, we can put our two models on two pieces of our model, huge model on two GPUs and write the config to say to, to the Triton, like uh, outputs of our tail need to be put as an input to the our head of the GPT-3 like model because it's one big model. And this quite simple config can be used to run full model, full GPT model on two GPUs in pipeline per release. And this overall picture, this is my final slide, I think. Uh, big green boxes are DGXN100 with eight GPUs, A100 with 40 gigs. And we have NB switch. Uh, this is quite, this is really fast interconnect communicator between our GPUs that allows to communicate to set to send tensors between GPUs, uh, avoiding the transfer of the data through the PCI Express, which is much slower. Yeah, it provides really high speed in the communication. So, and red box. This is my model uh, that I put on two GPUs. That Triton was uh, yeah, put it by Triton and GPU zero. This is uh, it has the tail of my model. And GPU one has the head of my model, part one and part two optimized by the tensor T. And this two model uh, concatenated with the config that I used for Triton. 
And that's it. We can send the requests, HTTP or gRPC request to this model using the name, only the name of this model and sending only the input text or text converted to the like float uh, vector or int vector. And that's it. Triton will run this pipeline and will send to you the response back. And all other boxes, the orange one, white one, and blue one, these are copies of my model. Triton allows you to, on, using only one line in your config, config, to duplicate, to clone your model and put it onto multiple different GPUs that you have, and to increase the throughput because all other GPUs can be used too to process the requests. And this allows you to process up to four more time, four more uh, times, four times more uh, requests per second. And this is really nice. Using only one line in, in the config, you can run this configuration, run this model for uh, four models on your DGXA100. And it works quite good. As I said, the videos, you can watch videos for more detailed explanations of each approach. And if you have some questions, I will be happy to answer. So guys, this is your time. Ask questions. We uh, very rarely have a Dennis with us. You know, he's a very busy oh, guy. So you. please do <laughs> ask questions. Come on. <laughs> Ariel? Hello. Yes, I have a question or, or two. So how common is this in industry? Uh, is, is, there, is this new framework or are there many organizations using it? Okay, the question was about the, how common is it for the industry, yeah? Industry and how common is it and widely is it used by different companies. It's used, the overall, this sphere is quite new. Uh, the huge model, we believe and we see that huge models, they are really great and they can provide really amazing results and can affect our future a lot. That's why we did this research and that's why we provided this inference solution and companies start to do this now and start to do this, the experiments and to use this training and inference approach. I know that one company at least in my region uses this, uh, maybe my colleagues can provide additional information. Yeah, but if did I understand question right? Because yeah, this is really important to save the, to utilize GPU more in, in a better, better way because model is quite heavy. That's why inference solution is really important. Yeah, so well, basically, um, and huge model, uh, we are attracted to it because of its uh, <laughs> amazing learning capability. Plus the fact that, you know, it can do zero, few shots um, really well, right? You just give it a new task and then actually learn really uh, quickly. And then it can actually complete those tasks really, really well. And that's why we are attracted to them, right? And it, again, two type of approach in the industry that we see and everything in between, right? So you have to train huge model you know, generative huge model and do, you know, zero few shot learning on the downstream tasks, or you train specialized model that do one task really, really, really well. And then you shrink the model as small as possible, such as in NVIDIA, we have like uh, ASR models that's uh, every year it getting better and smaller. And that, that's another type of, uh, um, how do you say, trend. So, um, to have such a huge model, as uh, uh, Dennis say, it's a very recent work that um, Dennis himself is involved and also, um, uh, how do you say, uh, adv advocate and then showcase that it's possible. Uh, so th these models are no longer like sitting in the data center server and nobody ever touch it. You can actually use it. So that's uh, what we are, you know, having Dennis here for, mm -hmm. to to tell you to advocate, like you know, this is how you do it, and you can actually do it by yourself now. If you have a DGX, go ahead and use it. Questions? Mm -hmm. More? And if I may add, actually, uh, so Dennis introduced uh, Triton Inference Server and Tensor RT. Those actually are quite mature products, and they are widely used in the industry. Actually, there are a lot of customers who are deploying their models using that. So what is quite new is to use this kind of tools to deploy such large models. So that's a new thing. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I can see. Of course, I was curious about uh, the reference cases, OpenAI, but we also have LF Alpha, and, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if they have custom solutions or if you've been working with them to be very concrete. Uh, I don't think that we can say a lot about our partnership, and th I think that all of the all updates will be provided uh, at the time GTC. when we, they will be ready. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they will be ready, and yeah. just uh, just wait for a new updates from our side. Uh, I can say that we are working really hard in this direction, and we are working on multiple updates for both of these approaches now, because. Yeah, we have some vision about what where the huge model move is moving now, but there are multiple variants possible. That's why we support combination of different tools uh, to uh, avoid uh, fast inference on for all of the future innovative uh, versions of the huge model. So I think this this will be nice. Yeah. If it is okay, I have two more questions, but. Uh... Is it okay, Sonodia? Or yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, how uh, how hard? Um, uh, what is the engineering time, or or to um, if you want to modify the models? How how is it something you do with competent engineers, or is it something you do in in uh, collaboration with Nvidia for inference? You have, if you have trained us a, a different model architecture. Uh, if you change the model architecture, as I said, for faster transforming, yeah, it will be really hard to uh, run the inference. And the best case is to use Triton. And if you have some really custom layers inside, because Triton uh, supports only a wide range of layers, but not all of them, some of like not so frequent using layers they are not supported but you can add these layers into TensorRT uh, manually and we have trainings multiple trainings at Nvidia that can help you to integrate these layers and after you did do this you will your model can be uh, like optimized and compiled and you can use it in inference in really optimal way and that's it the the mo the, the main recommendation is it's really hard if you have big cluster, it's really huge cluster. It's possible to do a lot of experiments with huge models. But what we see now is really hard because uh, one experiment may, may be about two months in or three months of training time. It's really hard to add some innovations, innovative layers and test this hypothesis. So main recommendation is to use quite already tested structures maybe combine already tested layers, types of models and combine them and use these tools that we presented because this will be the really optimal solution. And the last question is very technically oriented, but um, do you support batching uh, with, with inference? I mean, do you have a time window in the API where you collect multiple requests if, if you have a high load of requests or, or is it one request per, per model? Okay, uh, so about the batching, uh, let me think. Uh, you should, Triton uh, has it and supports the batching and you can put as an input when you send the request, additional ID or of your requests pipeline that to show that, for example, you are con trying to generate the next token for the sentence that you saw previously uh, that already was computed. And this works good, but I'm not sure to be honest, I didn't test this in Triton and faster transformer approach. And I didn't test it for my approach too. Uh, so it's this is the question that I think that we I need to dive into documentation more about the batching uh, because model quite high, huge, and I tested only one batch with the size one. But in general, we have a lot of tools to support batching in the autoregressive models to continue to provide the answers for the 
sentences that was already seen that were already seen by our uh, GPU serverless GPU. So, Ariel, are you satisfied? <laughs> cool. All right. Now that uh, we're moving on, um, I think uh, Ashish is here, and the uh, I we are still waiting for. Did you know if? Uh, uh, sorry, Dennis, could you please um, uh, send a PDF of your PowerPoint to, okay, sure. to the course. lecture material? Yes, just up, upload Thank it and, and give the link there. Hmm? Thanks a lot. Let's uh, give applause oh, uh, on, the, on the Zoom. <laughs> I would give an applause. Yay, like this. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dennis. I know that you're very busy. I'm so happy to have you here. <laughs> Okay, it's happy to be here. Thanks, Denadia, for this opportunity. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. We will call on you some other time. Hopefully, you do have the time some other time. <laughs> okay, so uh, Avanash is here. Ashish is here. Uh, so, you guys, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and share your um, and talk a few things about yourself? Um, introduce yourself. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm Avinash Kaur. I'm a data scientist at NVIDIA, and uh, I'm focused on training large language models. Uh, definitely nice to meet everybody. And uh, in this session, uh, we mainly wanted to introduce some of the recent topics that teams at NVIDIA have been working on, and in general, just a promising direction that the industry is taking. Um, I know it's been a very long three-day GPU uh, the GPT bootcamp. And so this session is basically meant to inspire some ideas for your own work that you can successfully like, conclude this uh, Megatron bootcamp. So thanks to the team for inviting us here. Um, I'll please share my screen. Let me know if you guys can see it. Uh, 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 um, Avanash, can, can we let Ashish also uh, introduce himself uh, before you start? Is that okay? Yeah, def definitely for sure. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so Ashish, could you unmute? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Zenodia, for inviting me to this event. And uh, thank you all for having us. Uh, uh, in this session, we would be talking, uh, particularly in my session, we would be looking at how NLP models can be applied to non-English languages, uh, particularly Indian languages like Hindi and Tamil. And uh, as a brief introduction about myself, uh, I work as a machine learning engineer in, at NVIDIA, and I uh, look at uh, productionizing conversational AI pipelines like speech recognition and NLP models. Cool, thanks a lot. Now um, you can start uh, uh, share the screen. I have an issue about it, yeah. Yeah, got it. <clears throat> um, can you guys see the screen? Not yet. I think you should be Starting to, yes, yes. Yeah. Next in NLP, yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, so for the agenda for this, um, this will be a quick presentation and uh, we, we have to follow up any questions at all because this is a new topic, so there will be many questions. For the agenda, I'll start with the four uh, training model training paradigms that we have in NLP today. And this will be followed by introducing prompt engineering methods as an approach to overcome some of the issues that we confront as we fine tune uh, very large language models. And uh, this will further be followed up by detuning as a method for effective prompt engineering. These are some of the promising approaches that were tried by some of our data scientists internally, and uh, we would love to introduce them to you. Um, I'll also talk about some of the future directions you can take based on these, and then I'll pass it on to Ashish to share his demo and work. Uh, sorry, um, Avanash, uh, could, could you also, before you pass it to Ashish, uh, do you want the, the question to be at the end or do you want it to, to be before? If uh, the audience has questions to you. Um, I Let us see. I mean, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go according to time. I'm happy to answer. Uh, but, but no problem because we have until three. So you, you don't have to rush at all. Okay, got it. Cool. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um, in terms of the overall NLP timeline, we started with the statistical methods first. So we started with things like naive Bayes, 
um, Baga words, and they usually resorted to fully supervised learning. And because uh, such fully supervised data sets are ever insufficient for training high quality models, early NLP models relied heavily on feature engineering. Um, then deep learning, of course, came along. And from 2017 to 2019, we started this pre-train and fine-tune paradigm of training our models. And that's what we are most familiar with today. But uh, something changed uh, with 2019. Uh, there's been quite some buzz in the industry with GPT coming along. However, uh, with very large models like GPT, GPT uh, 2 and 3 that follow them, fine-tuning these beast size models is not always feasible. And this is where we start to think about more uh, smarter approaches to basically uh, train our downstream tasks. And this is where we think about this pre-train prompt and predict method, which we talk about uh, in the rest of the slides today. All right. So based on this, our models fall into these four paradigms where we are focused on the third and the fourth one. The first two are the older ones, which we don't use anymore. So in the third row, that's the free train and fine tune. Notice in the diagram here, um, the circular thing, everything starts with the language model. So we take the language model and then we fine tune it. So here we adapt the language model to the downstream task that we want to uh, fine, -tune on, fine tune it on. This, as you can imagine, is an expensive process. The fourth row is the pre-train, prompt, and predict. And here, uh, we basically take the language model and we don't change it. So our pre-train language model becomes fixed. And our task is a form of query, a smart query. And we basically query this language model and get answers from it. So here, we adapt the downstream task to the language model. Uh, this may be a little unclear and confusing right now, but then it'll become clear soon. But before any of that, a quick note on the, uh, that a large part of this evolution in paradigms basically happened because of the increasing model sizes. So before 2019, uh, the model sizes were below 1 billion for the most part. And then from Megatron onward, we increased from 8.3 billion um, onward to enable training much larger uh, model sizes. GPT-3, as you know, is 175 billion parameters. And recently, NVIDIA, along with Microsoft, also trained a 530 billion parameter model. So we're, nobody is going to stop at these model sizes. It's only going to increase. But notice also that a lot of these models are GPT-style models. Uh, this is because BERT has a lot of difficulty in scaling up. Also in the second diagram below, uh, PanView Alpha, which was trained by Huawei, is 200 billion parameters, which is larger than GPT-3. Now, uh, why did I mention that? Because PanView has more parameters than GPT-3, it's more powerful. And there's something important to notice here. First of all, it surpasses GPT-3 in few short learning tasks, where GPT-3 faces issues with respect to few training data samples. Second, and this is the important one, the PanQ team added prompt-based tasks in the pre-training phase, which greatly reduced the difficulty of fine-tuning. The second point is the fourth paradigm of the pre-trained prompt and predict that I was talking about earlier. So uh, I've been saying the word prompt over and over. Let's have a closer look into what prompt engineering is. As you can see in the fourth column in this table, a uh, prompt is basically organizing the context or the input X and the target B, along with some prompt tokens to create what we call a template. So for example, for an input, I love this movie, the template says, I love this movie, the movie is blank. And the model needs to fill up with great, fantastic, and so on. Now there's all kinds of tasks that we can formulate using the different templates, which is evident in this table here. So for example, for text classification, we could do sentiment analysis, topics, intent classification. We could do text generation, so text summarization, translation, natural language inference, and there's just literally so many tasks there. But what's common across all of these is um, we basically, with different, different templates, different tasks can be formulated. So it's sort of general in that sense. Now, um, while this has great benefits, we can also start to see some of the shortcomings 
uh, because of this structure, there's some inflexibility here that the template needs to be a certain way for it to you know, give a certain answer. Um, we'll address these shortcomings in a bit, but even before talking about the shortcomings and the solutions, uh, this prompt engineering is a broad topic. There's a lot of ways of uh, doing prompt engineering and I'll briefly cover those first. So this is uh, all of the diagrams here in these slides come from this survey paper, which I've linked to the slides. This is called pre-trained prompt and predict a systematic survey of prompting methods. Uh, it was released this year. And this, this figure here presents a summary of all the techniques for prompting uh, tasks. So first and most importantly, we need a pre-trained language model, okay? Once we have the language model, then you can do the prompt engineering. Now, there are several methods shown here, and which one is chosen will depend both on the task and the model that is being used to solve the task. So here, I would like you to focus on the red portion for the most part. Um, we can think of prompts in terms of the shape of the prompt, and accordingly, we can have closed prompt or prefix prompt. Closed prompt are more um, uh, fill in the blanks uh, style prompts and prefix uh, prompts are mostly GPT-3 style of prompts. They're more uh, amenable to text generation tasks because they mesh well with the left to right nature of the model. Okay. Um, we can also think about prompts in terms of the human effort that's involved in creating those templates, right? So for example, this can be handcrafted, which is what they did with GPT-2. Uh, and that's also because human intuition is more structured that way. So we could also uh, get meaningful results and analyze the model, right? But we could also have automated prompts. Within the automated section, um, on one extreme, we have the discretized prompts, uh, discretized prompts, which basically search for the best word to fill in the template and give you good predictions. The other extreme is the continuous prompt, where instead of searching for the word, we search for the embeddings of the word. So this is trainable in some sense, and that's where the pre-tuning method of prompt engineering lies, and I'll cover that in a bit. Um, other than this, there's a lot of other advanced topics like ensembling the prompt and uh, parameter updating and just uh, multi-prompt learning and so on, and uh, you can have a look at uh, all of those in the survey paper. It's a pretty comprehensive. So uh, like I said before, there are several issues with manually crafting templates. Creating and experimenting with these prompts takes time and experience. And even uh, experienced prompt designers may fail to manually discover optimal prompts. Handcraft prompt searching, uh, additionally, heavily relies on impractically large validation sets, uh, which you can imagine. There's a very fixed number of uh, templates that we showed in that slide. For, a, for any new task that you introduce, anything new that you want, want an answer for, you have to create another template. So it's just in, impractical and infeasible in that sense. Also, I uh, wanted to highlight that its performance is volatile in that sense. So in this table, if you look at the last row, um, we're taking the precision at one as a metric. So in the last row, it's the highest only because the prompt was designed a certain way. We can't always rely on such a process, right? So this is where P-tuning comes in. Instead of relying on handcrafted prompts, the lesser prompt tokens be trainable embedding sensors. And this will become more clear in the next slide. So, um, okay, so how does all of this work? First of all, the function of a prompt, say P, is to organize the context X, the target Y, and itself into this template T that you see in the first line. So the capital of dash is dash, okay? Then in a second bullet here, our traditional sort of discrete prompt with the handcrafted template will include the embeddings of the prompt tokens. Remember, when we input any sequence into the model uh, with the pre-trained embedding layer, everything is converted into those embeddings. So we get these embeddings here, but this is what, what we would like to change in terms of uh, prompt engineering. So P-tuning with regards to the individual prompt tokens, uh, they convert them to pseudo tokens or sorry, we actually call them pseudo tokens, and it basically maps the template to include trainable embedding sensors, which are denoted by small letter H. And that's the main difference here in the two paradigms. And then finally, we optimize this continuous prompt using the downstream loss function L. So the same function for the target downstream task, we use that to optimize these and uh, get 
uh, are trainable, trained tensors in the end. So uh, a little more clarity to this. Um, in this diagram, for example, uh, the sentence is, the capital of retain is mask. So here, uh, given the blue zone, the blue uh, written word here, uh, which is the context in our case, and the target word, which is red, that's the mask, that's what we would like the model to fill. The orange zone or the orange words basically are the prompt two things. Okay, so in the first one, the left diagram, which is the discrete prompt search, our prompt tokens are input embedding and the prompt generator only receives discrete rewards. Whereas in the second diagram, um, where we're using key tuning, the pseudo prompts are trainable tensors and they can be optimized in a differential way. Uh, I hope the diagram made a bit more sense. But in order to improve results, sometimes we can also include some anchor prompt tokens. For example, in this sentence, the capital of written is mass capital could be an anchor uh, token like that. So including some of those sometimes improves performance. Um, all right. So in terms of results, uh, we consider the knowledge for probing precision at one on the LAMA 34K, which is on the left side, the left table, and the LAMA 29K, which is the right one. We see that the tuning outperforms all the discrete prompting, uh, prompt searching baselines. Um, and on the LAMA 2090, which is the uh, right table, despite uh, fixed pre-trained model parameters, it's it pretty much overwhelms the fine-tuning GPTs in uh, this particular task uh, in all the models. In the first one, we see, for example, for the BERT large case, it's the uh, second row that's 32.3 precision at one, and uh, with the P-tuning, we have 50.6. There are also, uh, comparing the different prompting methods here, so the manual prompts or manual prompting along with fine tuning and so on. But then simply using key tuning itself has shown interesting results. Um, I haven't included the results for the internal experiments we did here uh, because of some data set issues and those kind of things. So mostly uh, talking about the results from the paper, but then internally also we found out, for example, for uh, GPT-2 uh, models, uh, in the paper, they needed 32 to 50 prompts for the uh, Q-shot task. Uh, in our case, we got great results with just two prompts and um, other similar results. So overall, it's, it's, uh, it definitely has been a promising approach on the few experiments that we've done internally. Um, and yeah, which is why I wanted to share this with you guys today. So there are several interesting directions that we can take from here. Uh, there's definitely a lot of research going on in the industry on how to make the language models uh, truly in a, a database in some sense. So here our prompt will basically be a smart query and we get our answers from this very large database is how uh, they're thinking about it. Secondly, because all the knowledge in the model is present in a distributed sort of way across the parameters, Finding smarter ways to insert new information in our model or update it or delete information um, is another sort of hot topic that is being pursued. Using uh, Megatron GPT-3 for prompt engineering or GPT application for automating data science search is another direction you guys could take. Um, NVIDIA is working on ways to accelerate the large language model development and deployment process with new solutions. And all these advances can help us take some of these. Um, with that, I'll conclude the talk and I'll, I'll actually pass it on to Ashish. I see I have overshot my time quite a bit. Sorry about that. Um, please reach out for any questions. Thank you, guys. So um, if you guys uh, have questions, you can ask it now. Otherwise, we will pass it to Ashish. Questions? This is uh, actually quite interesting. I hope you guys get excited because I am really excited. Can't wait to experiment. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot to take in. Um, it will be sure to actually reach out to you. It's really a lot to take in. So, <laughs> in such a short time. All right, Ashish, you're up. All right, I'll just share my screen. Yes, you need to share your screen. Um, I think, uh, Avinash, can you unshare your screen? So, it won't be interrupted or yeah i'm, I'm trying to do that <laughs> okay yeah found it cool so you're up okay 
we are waiting just a sec. It might take time. No, we still don't see the screen. You might need to redo it again. It's got it. Uh, can you see it now? Wait, wait, it says that you're sharing screen. So I'll give it a second. That's weird. It take a bit longer than necessary. Hmm. Are you sharing the right window? I'm not sure because I have. Uh, it, it says that you are you are starting to share, but we still have not yet see your screen yet. I guess my screen. Another way to do it is that if you could uh, send me the link, if you share the link to this, I can share my screen, um, and and you just tell me to next slide it. Okay, I'll share. In, in, in the email or in the Slack or? In the Slack, okay. I shared a link with uh, you, Benodi, in case you received any email just now. That's the presentation. And I also gave you the read permission. OK. Uh, wh where did you say you, you share it on Slack? Um, or? Uh, let, me, let me do that. OK. Cool. I am going to open it, and then I'll share my screen. Uh, give me a second. I guess my Zoom crashed when I was sharing <laughs> my screen. Uh, no problem. I, I can the... share my screen. I can share my screen okay. instead. Um, do you want me to uh, download it, open in desktop? OK. Uh, I share my screen, just a sec. Uh, share screen, share. It's importing. This is your screen and this is your, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, you can go to slide 18. That's where this one okay. Goes. Slide 18, 18, if I can count. <laughs> Here <Yeah>. it is. <laughs> uh, give me a second. I'm going to make it into this mode. Cool. OK, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining again. So. Um, I know this is not a language which most of us speak, uh, but uh, I hope that through this 10-15 uh, minutes talk that you'll be able to learn about how we can uh, apply uh, any research which is happening in NLP, uh, research around uh, classification uh, models to translation models to summarization models, how we can apply those uh, research methodologies into non-English languages like uh, um, Swedish or German or French or even Indic languages on which I have particularly experimented and how well these te uh, NLP techniques scale uh, when we apply them to non-English languages. Our next slide. So a uh, quick uh, agenda overview. Uh, we are going to first look at the challenges of uh, using these techniques on other languages, so particularly Indic languages. Um, then we will look at some of the experiments that we have done uh, on training machine translation models on uh, Indic languages, uh, models which go from 300 million parameters all the way up to 4 billion parameters, and we'll see how the accuracies scale up. And then towards the end, we will uh, look at a real uh, a live demo of speech recognition and machine translation uh, in action in which we would be 
speaking in English and uh, getting the transcription in Hindi, which is an Indic language. Next slide. Okay, so uh, uh, there are many challenges pertaining to Indic languages, and I uh, and I think that there are many challenges pertaining to other non-English languages as well, which are less discussed in the uh, research world. So first of all, the major issue with other languages and Indic language is low resource, which means the availability of data, uh, freely usable data to perform research upon is very less available uh, in the public. Second, um, specific to Indic languages, there are about 198 regional languages which are spoken in India. And out of those 22 languages are the most widely spoken ones. Uh, even though there are, um, uh, there are some similarities between these 22 widely spoken languages, there are very language specific uh, challenges that, that people or researchers face uh, in the NLP space. Third, uh, there are very much defined standardized lexicon sets for English or Spanish or German languages, but there is no lexicon set which is defined for uh, Indic languages like Hindi. And um, languages uh, like Hindi contains 46 characters as opposed to just 26 characters in English, which also poses another challenge. And uh, there are some particular challenges pertaining to um, Hindi and um, pertaining to Dravidian languages, which are mostly languages spoken in the southern part of India. And then there are specific challenges pertaining to uh, Indo-Aryan languages, which are spoken in the northern part of India. And uh, even those challenges uh, resist the researchers to perform research on NLP research on uh, Indic languages. Next slide. So even though there are a lot of challenges and uh, particularly with uh, Indic uh, language, uh, we still try to uh, train um, speech recognition and translation and other kind of models. And this is just one of the experiment that we have performed on uh, Hindi language, uh, which is the mother tongue of India and uh, which is a national language of India. And this is a machine translation experiment that we did uh, on a data set, which had a parallel corpus of English to Hindi of about 8.6 million uh, samples. And uh, the aim of this uh, experiment was to try the effect of multiple model architectures like, um, like BERT, uh, of 345 million parameters and BERT of 3.9 billion parameters and the most basic architecture, which is attention is all you need of 150 million parameters and see how well these model architectures scale when we apply them to a very small data set and of a different language. And we followed the similar um, pre-processing, um, we followed the similar nomenclature and pre-processing techniques for this particular experiment. So we clean the data set, normalize the data set, and converted all the text to lowercase, which is a standard process we do for machine translation for uh, typical NLP tasks. And what we observed uh, when we did these experiments was that, yes, uh, the scaling the model architecture did help us in getting better blue scores or accuracy scores, uh, even for a non-English language and a small data set. And uh, when we were conducting these experiments, we were also testing these models on uh, left out uh, data sets, which are typically used for tests, uh, uh, which are typically used to test the performance of translation models on different kind of domains, like news or articles or textbook. And we found that the models that we have trained outperforms all the other public models which are uh, trained on this data set and tested on these different domain data sets. Next slide. 
Um, another key thing which uh, we realized when we were performing uh, these training experiments was that uh, even though there are different tokenizers available for different languages, uh, like for English, there are there's a Moses tokenizer, there is sentence piece tokenizer, uh, there's a recently released tokenizer by the name of Groot. Uh, we realized that there are different tokenizers on the Indic uh, side as well. So specifically for Hindi language, there are four different kind of tokenizers, which goes by Indic NLP, INLTK, CN CLTK, uh, and of course, Moses and OpenNMT. And uh, it was important for us to uh, see the effect of these tokenizers on our model. And hence, uh, which in turn, which increases the amount of experiments we would have to run uh, to, to find out which tokenizers work the best for which language. So as a quick example, uh, I know most of you cannot read this language, but as a quick example, uh, even if there's a simple sentence on the first row, uh, the two most popular tokenizers uh, on the second and the third row, which is used most popularly by the uh, Indian researchers community, uh, tokenizes the text uh, which uh, looks like the text is tokenized in a similar sense. But uh, uh, if you observe the sixth character in the third sample, which is a vertical, uh, which is also called as a O in Hindi, is different. And, uh, and if you observe in the second sample, there's a next line character in the Indic NLP tokenizer, which is skipped, which is not present in the INLTK tokenizer. So these sm very small differences uh, in the tokenization uh, world itself for Indic language or any other language makes a huge difference in the accuracy as we will observe in the next slide. So uh, this is a snippet of uh, the number of training experiments we ran for just one model architecture with different configurations. So we took uh, the base attention is all you need model. And we uh, tried uh, permutation and combinations of English and Hindi tokenizers, which is the fourth and the fifth column. And we also uh, tried to tune the beam size and the length penalty, which is uh, the eighth and the ninth column. So, these are the two hyperparameters which are uh, specific to machine translation uh, and, and different kind of tasks in which we have to generate text. But uh, the English and the Hindi tokenizer made much more difference uh, when, we train, when we ran the experiments as compared to these hyperparameters. So uh, as you can see, and this is just for one model architecture, uh, as you can see, for just one model architecture, we ran about 30 odd experiments and uh, uh, we tested this model on using the metric called as sacred blue score. And uh, we realized that even though there is very uh, hand tuned tokenizers available uh, in the open source world, like Indic NLP and INLTK, the uh, Moses tokenizer, which is uh, which was specifically uh, written for English language, uh, performed best, uh, gave the best results uh, when we used it for both when we used it to pre-process both English and Hindi languages. Um, so if we compare uh, our best results, which is on the fourth row, which is also highlighted in green, and our uh, second best results, which is the row below that. Uh, only the beam size uh, hyperparameter made the difference, but the tokenizer was the same. And if we observe uh, the serial number seven, uh, which is uh, English tokenizer of OpenNMT and Indic NLP uh, Hindi tokenizer, uh, in this row, we can see that even though uh, Indic NLP is a very specific tokenizer for Hindi language, it uh, didn't perform as well as Moses tokenizer. So uh, after running these experiments, we learned that um, the techniques or the tokenization and the pre-processing techniques, which were developed for English, 
uh, did uh, outperform the uh, handwritten tokenization techniques which were written for Indic language. Next slide. And here's a quick uh, snippet of uh, our results uh, that we have achieved so far. So uh, the first three rows are the experiments which were uh, run by us. And the last three rows are the results available publicly. So, uh, and we have compared our results across three data sets, uh, which is WAT 2020, WAT 2021, and WMT. And we have uh, 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 compared our results with not just a, a publicly available research model, but also against publicly available machine translation services by Microsoft Azure and Google GCP. So, um, after running these experiments, we found out that, as you can also see from this table, that we, uh, as we scale up the size of the model architecture, uh, keeping all the rest of the hyperparameters the same, um, we have been able to in get better blue scores um, in the case of uh, Megatron Bird 3.9 billion parameter model as compared to the other models which are uh, which we have trained and which are also publicly available. So this helped us confirm our belief that yes, we can uh, train larger models, get better results. And of course, this is a supervised learning task. So uh, even though we have smaller data sets, just 8.6 million pairs of English to Hindi, we were still able to uh, scale up the accuracies of our model. Next slide. Um, this is a demo application um, uh, uh, which performs speech recognition and machine translation. I have to re I have to reshare it because apparently uh, I, I need when I share it I need to share the sound. So uh, yeah, give me a second. Uh, yes. Yes, I need to share the sound, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So now I can. Yes. This is the front end of the web based application. For this application, we would be using the default language model for speech recognition and the English to Hindi translation model. Let's start. Excuse me, I'm looking for the famous Pin Baluchi restaurant. It's nearby, but I don't see it on the maps. Can you show me the way? I'm very hungry. As you can see, the translations are pretty good and has happened in real time. So uh, this was a, a, um, a speech recognition model, which, uh, which is quite state of the art and is available out of the box, an English speech recognition model. And the machine translation model that we used was the Megatron BERT 3.9 million parameter model which was trained by us uh, on this data set. Wow. Next slide. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is just a quick architecture of the application, uh, which we, which, for which the demo was displayed. And uh, it's basically a combination of uh, Reva's speech recognition system, uh, Reva is a uh, SDK and a framework provided by NVIDIA for speech recognition, NLP, and uh, text-to-speech. And uh, uh, we have additionally added a component of machine translation uh, to it so that we can, in real time, uh, take the transcription from Riva speech recognition and then translate it into uh, Hindi language. And uh, these both of these uh, the two different modules have been deployed on NVIDIA Triton uh, server, which uh, Dennis has already given the details of, which allows us to deploy them and get the response in real time. Next slide. So yeah, uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. And we are open for questions. 
And um, yes, uh, before we uh, ask uh, the questions, um, we have a special guest. <laughs> so Charles, would you like to say a few words? Are you here? Xintao, did you know if he's here? Could you unmute yourself, Xintao? Yeah, I just saw Charles uh, several minutes before. Okay. He's not here anymore. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry, okay, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So Very you want to say a few words about that, uh, maybe? Uh, yeah, Charles is in charge of uh, European uh, range uh, FSI uh, service and as a technical lead. So if uh, our, our friend here is interested in FSI and also uh, any uh, applications of that domain, please uh, connect with him as well. So thank you very much. I will share the, his uh, connection email later. So sorry for this uh, sudden uh, <laughs> no, interruption. No uh, sorry, uh, Ashish, it's a great uh, presentation. I did a uh, machine translation uh, during my PhD six years. So I hope to communicate with you later. So most yes, so many language models. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's talk. Most welcome. Guys, we very seldom has, has this kind of opportunity. Ask your questions. Come on. <laughs> oh, I have a question. So you did it on uh, Hindi mostly, right? Um, did you also, how was the difference between Hindi and Tamil for you as Tamil is a Dravidian uh, language? So it's a very different uh, language family. Yes. So uh, the data set, which is available, uh, the most uh, 8.6 million pairs were available for English to Hindi. And we, diff we also tried it for English to Tamil, which was about 4.5 million pairs. And we saw a consistent increase in uh, blue scores for Tamil as well. What we couldn't uh, achieve, and we are still trying to uh, triage who as to why, is uh, training a model on uh, English to Hindi and then fine tuning that uh, encoder, of encoder and decoder models to English to Tamil. Or maybe taking two Dravidian languages like English to Tamil, training a model on English to Tamil, and then fine tuning it on English to Telugu, for example. We haven't been able to successfully train mod, uh, do transfer learning in this fashion. But yes, these uh, scaling model architectures have worked uh, well for Tamil language as well, or Dravidian languages for, as well. All right, cool. So you didn't see any like large issues uh, between language families? Uh, no, not for these two, yes. Guys, we are on top of the hours. Do you have any more questions? Otherwise, we will. Uh, I will. I will share with you guys of um, the uh, presentation. Oh, I have a very quick uh, question. So yeah, sorry. Uh, I am wondering. Uh, do Do they have any word order issue between uh, Hindi and English? They are both uh, subject verb uh, object languages. I'm not sure about the details. Can you repeat your question? Oh, I mean, do they have the same word order? Uh, means that the verb will be between the subject and object? No, no. So do you need to do reorder uh, inside the model or do not do it uh, explicitly? Because, you know, when we uh, say Japanese, the verb actually appears at the end of the sentence, quite different from English, right? I eat lunch will go to I lunch eat actually in Japanese. So that makes the translation to be very, very difficult when you uh, evaluate based on blue score, right? It's just a gram a matching, uh, for gram matching, uh, yeah. So act actually we, we use a lot of human evaluation to, to check the, the accuracy, which is not aligned well with blue score, actually. I'm not sure about uh, the, the language you are doing, how about it? Okay. Um, um... In that sense, no, there's not much reordering which is required for Hindi, not mm -hmm. much pre-processing which is required for Hindi because mm -hmm. the verbs are not that much uh, out of place uh, as it is for Japanese or even for French. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we just rely on the model to uh, take care of that. Okay, thank you. 
great talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, last call. <laughs> Any more uh, questions? Cool. You know, this is not the last time, you know, we are here for you. So, um, you guys, um, I had to promote this. So, um, <laughs> let's get back to this. Um, our, um, uh, uh, we have GTC is coming. Uh, it is in November, uh, from the 8th November. So, you know, watch out for the keynote as well as a lot of really good talks. Uh, these talks, including one of these right here, featuring Sweden Magna Selglen. So please do watch that, you know, that's put Swedish on the map. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy uh, to, be, um, to be in this book and I hope that you have good experiences. Please remember to write in the survey. Um, again, go to the master document and then um, uh, fill out the survey so that we can improve ourselves before you go. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all the TAs, thank you guys for joining. Thank all the speakers, as well as um, our kind um, um, participate, particip participation from all the attendees. And um, I really, really hope to see you guys very, very soon. Thanks a lot and have a good day. Thank you, everyone.